there is the sunset. I don't know why I always do this to myself, but I do. I always leave super late. So I am loading up on gas and we are about to hit the road. I have a six hour drive to Dallas, Texas. It's gonna be a long drive. It is 8 p.m. and I'm just now leaving. So it is going to be a very long drive in the dark, which is gonna suck. But I have three bottles of six hour energy. I already drank one. I got a whole bunch of barbecue chicken from Walmart's Daily. My sister hooked it up. Two packs of barbecue chicken. I got a box of Coconut Edition Red Bull, which is also my favorite. And I also got a box of Sour Patch Kids. My sister hooked it up, so I am ready to hit the road. Oh, by the way, guys, first road trip in my new truck, so I'm excited to break it in. I may do some car camping, I may not, we'll see, I don't know. But uh, we do have a place to stay, I believe we have a hotel and also a few people's houses down there that we're gonna stay in. We're gonna do a bunch of fishing, I hope. I've heard there's gonna be some hog hunting, maybe, I'm not too sure, no promises on that, but uh, it's gonna be an awesome trip. I'm just excited to get away and go fish some new waters because my lake has been dead. No fish at all, no bites. It has been horrible. So I'm hoping to fish some new waters and get on some new fish, but uh, let's hit the road. All right, it is 2.26. I am one minute away. I am freaking exhausted. I'm gonna get there and crash out so quick. All right, so it is the next morning. Today we are traveling down to somewhere. I have no idea, honestly. I just heard about this trip and what we're doing this morning as I got here. But I do know we're going to the airport, picking up two more people at two different airports, and then we're driving somewhere. I have no idea, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know much about this trip, I'm just here, so. So I did get some information about this trip and we are actually gonna be working on a boat down there. So we got a bunch of people to, uh, help out on this boat build but that is James I am following him to the destination and we're actually gonna be putting in some work on his pelican so that's gonna be pretty cool you know this is how all my trips are there's really never no final destination it's just wherever I end up that's where I'm at so I'm not sure how long I'm gonna be down here for I have no idea of anything but I need to plan better I'm not in control here all right this is not my trip I'm just here along with the tin can crew which is cool. First time meeting a few of these guys, so I'm excited about that as well, but let's go pick them up from the airport. All right, loading up on gas again. My truck did really good. I got here on one tank of gas and I had a quarter tank left, so six hours of driving. This truck is a beast. I'm really, really happy with this truck. This truck tells me all the info, like tire pressure and all that stuff, gas mileage that I have left. On my last trips, I was always so paranoid about my tires going flat. For some reason, I just, anxiety. And the fact that this truck tells me the air pressure, I love it. I have no stress at all driving this truck. So first trip in the new truck is a success so far. But we're actually heading to Texarkana, which is uh, three hours away. So we have to go pick up two people from the airport, Michael and Ryan. And then we're heading off to Texarkana. Gonna go work on a boat and then do some fishing. I heard we're staying at a lodge with a private pond. So that sounds absolutely amazing. I cannot wait for that. But uh, here we go, let's hit the road. All right, so we are splitting up. Since we got two trucks, he's gonna head to the Dallas airport and go pick up Michael. And I'm heading to Lovefield airport to go pick up Ryan. So save a little bit of time on this trip. Man, I freaking love Dallas. Or wherever the hell we are. <laughs> All right, so I'm at the airport now picking up Ryan, but we just found out that Michael's flight got canceled in Las Vegas, so that sucks. But we're gonna meet up in Greenville, Texas, but on the way to Greenville, there is a Bass Pro Shop. So since we now have time to kill, me and Ryan are gonna go check out Bass Pro Shops, and I'm gonna go get some big spoon baits that I can't find back at my house locally. So it sucks that Michael's flight got canceled, but we're gonna make the best of it, kill some time in Bass Pro Shops, and I guess just wait. We'll figure out what we're doing, but uh, man, Flying right now is so stupid. Flights are getting canceled. You can't get anywhere. It sucks. All right, so we're at Bass Pro Shops. I'm getting a few things. Just waiting on James to show up. And then we're taking off to Texarkana. Let's go see some big bass. Y'all wanna see some big bass? Hopefully we catch some big bass on this trip, but we'll see. See what we can do. I got all the gear I need for it. Dude, a center console fiberglass boat. 
How much? 25,000. I really don't like the shape of it though. That thing is kind of ugly. But I do want a fiberglass center console boat or a skiff, I guess you could call it. Well guys, unfortunately, Michael is not gonna be able to make it. They canceled his flight and you can't get another one. So Michael can't make this trip, which sucks, but we got some stuff here. Got some uh, crawls. And we're going to a private pond, so I want to see just how big the bass are in this pond. So we got some 10 inch worms. So we're going to be throwing those around. Got some of these too. Look at this color. That green on this worm is insane. It just looks nuts. And then I got a Whopper Flopper. I've never had one before and they had them here. So I figured, you know what, let's get one. So hopefully we can catch some big old bass in this pond that we're going to go to. But yeah, once again, Michael is not going to make the trip. Which sucks. To be honest with you, none of us know really what the f we're doing. <laughs> like, yeah. I understand that. <laughs> That's like every business though. You just kind of start and you just kind of jump into it, man. So we are making a stop here at the Dobbins Rods facility. Gary Dobbins is a veteran of the sport of bass fishing. With decades of tournament angling under his belt and over 100 major tournament victories, winning over 36 boats and the 2010 US Open, Gary Dobbins has made a huge name for himself in the world of bass fishing, and today we get to go meet him and get a tour of his rod facility. We need stability. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, not yeah. so much. Yeah. We need stability. No. There are this for 200 bucks. Really? Yeah, and they're going to put, I mean, I bet you they're going to put $3,000 of shit on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but you know why this market was big? And this is why I told, told uh, Michael, who was the starter of this, I said, you know, I haven't bought a boat in a few years, but I said, people are tired of spending fifty to hundred thousand dollars on a fucking boat. Good fifties on the way, way. I know. Too, That's maybe. a piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it is. So, That's the reason the aluminum market's so strong, you yeah. know, because you know, I mean. So there's guys it. with a three thousand dollar boat who put ten thousand on it, or they get a you know a ten thousand dollar boat and they'll put ten thousand dollars a year or fifteen twenty thousand dollars a year on it, and they and, you know they've got all the electronics, the trolling motor. You know, they've got, you know, a brand new carpet, like, you know. Um, and they're fishing. Yeah. And they're fishing. <laughs> and, they're and that's fishing. all they got to have to go fishing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. dude, that's what I, you know, guys ask me all the time, well, you know, I can't afford it. And I tell them, I probably to this day have still caught more bass out of pond jumpers and aluminum boats than I probably still have the big glass boats. Because yeah. I've always, I've always maintained. <laughs> So Gary gave us the rundown of all his baits and why he makes them the way he makes them, but I will be putting all that information at the end of the video. There is a lot of great information, great tips on everything, why Gary fishes how he fishes, why he loves the Cinco, why he moved down here to Texas. So all of that will be at the end of the video. Those are for the people that want to watch it. So expect that coming soon, but let's keep checking this place out. Holy crap. He said this is all public land hunts. That's insane. This book here is not. This video does not do justice of how big these are. <laughs> they are huge. It just, it was such a confidence builder. And fishing, so much of it, it revolves around confidence. It's unbelievable. Let's go check out the back warehouse. This is where they package everything. And this is cool. Look at all these rods. This is the behind the scenes of a rod company. I wish this was Okuma. I wish I'd love to go check out Okuma's factory, but this is cool too. I didn't even know we were coming here. Like I said, this trip is unplanned. I had no idea what we're doing, but we ended up here in a rod factory checking it all out behind the scenes. Pretty crazy. 
Yeah, yeah it's so freaking light that it's, <laughs> you talk about sensitive they can't even breathe on this thing that you don't feel them Damn. it's freaking it's absolutely freaking amazing yeah. Yeah. This is the clothing room, which is usually always a freaking mess. And um, we're, we're not good with our clothing. I'll be the first to admit it, we're not. It's one of the things that when it, if I'd had the time to work on it, something that I really, really work on. With this room, that's large. I'll, check it. I'll take a large. Thank you, sir. This is sweet. You'll cuss me right now, but I tell you, that in the winter, yeah, no, that is a warm. Those I, suckers are warm. I can already feel it. Like it feels yeah. thick. Holy There's more? Jesus. This is crazy. So much stuff. There's a boat. I see a boat. I found the bass boot. <laughs> oh my god. Look how nice this boat is. Holy crap. Now that's a boat. Drop it off to you. Wow. Brand new? Man. Yeah, they didn't put lighters in for a or nothing. Dude, that's crazy. That's a big <laughs> motor. I mean, you know it's all the old Ranger guys. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Dude, those guys have treated me like family for 40 years almost. So 39, I think. But yeah. So there's no doubt what boat I'm going to run. Yeah. I mean, those, those guys, and they, when you somebody treats you that good for so long, there's no way you're going to turn it back. Yeah. They build a hell of a boat. Yeah. That thing is clean. You see all the foam in there? Look inside there. Look at the foam on the floor. Almost burnt. These guys build decks like this. Look just like this for like a 16, 17, 15, 14 really? foot jumbo. They got all the hatches, this hatch. They got a live well. It's crazy, man. That's awesome. And they just drop it off for you? Yeah, they brought it in. Oh, I don't know. Heck yeah. I mean, in all honesty and truth, they, they built this one with wrong colors the inside wasn't supposed to be black mm -hmm. and i was do a boat you know they knew i was gonna need both and they just said hey will you take it because that's the color on the outside i want it <laughs> will you I take said, it I black inside. who cares you know hey, right. <laughs> and, and they take such good care of me i don't i'd never tell those guys no yeah Heck yeah all right guys so that is going to be it for this video but this video is not over yet there's still a lot more to be said gary had a whole lot to say to us and we just soaked it all in when i'm around someone that's big in the industry in any industry or just someone that's super smart i will soak in anything that they have to say i will just sit there and listen no matter how long it takes so uh if you're like that if you're just like me and you want to hear some information that gary has to say about everything then stay tuned because I'm throwing everything that he said at the end of this video, which is right here. But uh, just listen. If you don't want to listen to all that, you can leave now. I hope you all enjoyed the video. But uh, yeah, so Gary talked about everything. Why he moved his company to Texas. Why he loves fishing a Cinco. How he makes his bait and why he makes his bait the way he makes them. He talks about fishing and putting way too much pressure on yourself. And also talks about winning the U.S. Open. So if you guys want to hear anything about that, stay tuned. Here's the video. I hope you all enjoy it. I use the same exact keeper on, a, on all the jigs. So now guys are saying instead of going through two packs of, uh, of trailers in a day, I go through two trailers in a day. Here's one called a green weenie that's got five colors. But it, it, every color has a location that it goes to. What, what what are the like uh, like if people need to get you know your top two jig colors what would that be? That's very hard. We make yeah. a dozen, and I'm say they they all sell well. Black and blue in Texas obviously is one of the top ones. Green weenie is a really top one. Green magic crawl. If I have one, I'll leave it out here. This is magic crawl. That is, it's just a weird kind of color, but it's one of our number one sellers. And, you know, for a lot, a lot of years, I couldn't I couldn't buy the jigs that I wanted when I was tournament fishing, So, and I wanted a 604 hook, so I just simply made them. I mean, I ordered from Gamagatsu, and, and I made my own jigs. I always made my custom jigs for fishing tournaments yeah. because I couldn't get the jig that I wanted. Yeah. So I got to make it. And why, and why do you do this, the eye tie this way versus the other way. Some people have questions about that. You know, it's, that's just a, because that's the way it comes on a 604 Gamagatsu hook. <laughs> that's about the biggest yeah. way to answer, best way to answer that. Yeah. That's what comes on. Because I'm such a believer in this hook. They call it a heavy wire, but it's not. It's, yeah. it's heavy enough that there's no spring to it. 
You know, you get a springy hook, you don't get penetration, you know? So this hook's got no, it's big enough that it's got no spring, but yet you look at it, it's a small diameter. This one's been cut off, of course, if we play with it all the time. But that is, without a doubt, in my opinion, as far as a round band jig hook, there's nothing There's nothing on the market that'll even come close to a 604 gammy hook. It's just the best that there is. So that was, that's what started it. And then everybody is always hung up on the EWG, which is, you know, there's a lot of guys that really like the EWG hook. So, you know, to make those guys happy, this is a white vision. Obviously, it's a sight fishing bait. There's no doubt about it. But you'd be surprised out here how many guys are using it for, uh, for some of these stripers and stuff around here locally. It has everything that the, that the other jig had, the collar, the barbs, everything. It's just got an EWG hook in it. Hand tied skirt. Again. Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, hand tied is wow. a big deal. Oh, I mean, yeah. So you get grass on it, you can slap that thing on the water and, and make another cast. You can't yeah. slap a slip on skirt on the water and all slides down. So it just makes it more efficient. Like I said, you just slap it on the water and you go. Again, every color has got a specific location. The other thing about this spinner bait that is that is probably probably one of the coolest things about it is and hold on, when you say a specific location on the skirt, yeah. you're saying that certain colors need to be they have the bottom, to, or? They have to oh, be in a certain yeah. place. Yeah, okay, now I see what you're saying. Yeah. Every color has got a place to be on that spinnerbait. It yeah. has to be there. This, this skirt here is tied, every strand is side by side by side by side. It sounds crazy, oh. but you look at it. Every skirt strand there's no overlapping strands in that you'll have a perfectly balanced skirt i wow. mean and that helps the bait always run through it's going to run through anyway but it helps it and you don't have a, a you know a big bunch of, of skirt material on one side of your spinner mate not on the other and you're trying to spread it it's hand tied but if you look every one of those strands is side by side by side around that bait that awesome. one lady ties these she ties 300 a day Wow. I couldn't tie three in a day. I probably just <laughs> slip my wrist. But it, uh, it, uh, she ties three hundred a day for me, and it's Dang. just. But it's amazing. But it it makes a perfectly balanced spinnerbait. And we got all the different colors, you know. I mean, we've got parrot, you know, for the dirty water. We've got this is obviously a really good clear water spinnerbait. It's really really popular in Western lakes. But there's still a lot of water. I still talk to fishermen. I had a guy in here um, this week that's. He's really struggling on a local lake right here, and he said it's clear. And I'm like, it's, I said, it's, it's a clear water lake. There's not a lot of wood. No, no, there, it's rock and stuff. And I'm like, you throw a net weighted sinker? He goes, never heard of it. I'm like, you're kidding me. I mean, I said, I promise you. He goes, nobody does that. The fish will. I mean, yeah. the fish will. You throw a net weighted sinker in there, and I absolutely guarantee you. He goes, you guarantee me? I said, I'll tell you what, buddy. I, are, I owe his dad a, a, a boat trip anyway. So I said, we'll go. And if, we, if I can't catch a nail weighted sinker, I'll publicly kiss your ass, okay? Because <laughs> no, I'm going to catch him in a nail weighted sinker. I've never been anywhere in the world that I haven't caught him a nail weighted sinker. Yeah. Um, I got to win a little competition thing in, China, in uh, Korea. I Truthfully, I've thrown a nail weighted cut tail worm because I ran out of sinkos. But nail weighted baits are here. I mean, they're not going away. It's, yeah. it's deadly. You just need to upsize your hook and stuff. You're going to go cast and rod, and, and you catch them. Yeah. Little nail weight like that. Where do you put that now? You put it right in the head of the right in the head of the sinko, and you will not believe how fast it'll make that. It'll make that sinko fall straight down. Even that little bitty weight will make it fall straight down. And the sinko's got so much salt in it, so it's going down my fish. So truthfully, we've caught a lot of fish and, and caught a lot of tournament fish fishing 50 to 60 foot of water. Believe it or not, it's crazy. Now I prefer to stay upwards of 20, but I'm not afraid to go down deep after them at all. It's just day in and day out. Colors, Yamamoto Senko. My favorite is, is watermelon, green pumpkin, laminate. That's my all time favorite. But I throw a ton of green pumpkin. Um, you know, I throw a ton of baby bass. And no that was the info I needed. I fish a very bad. deep lake and I, I never even fun. thought about throwing a Senko. So I'm gonna go back home and throw some weighted Senkos down 40 feet, like he said, and I'm gonna yeah. give it a try. So new tips for me. Now, if you're fishing some of these lakes, like let's talk about my local lake, Lake Fork. I throw a lot of things, nail weighted sinkholes there too. I tend to do it, I do it on bait caster. I'm terrified to throw a light line on the spinner rod in Lake Fork. It's solid trees everywhere. 
So most of the time I'll come up, I'll throw like 14 or 15 pound test. Do the four or five power if you're doing that. And I'll tell you, I mean, I weighed the biggest bag in California Delta in an FLW tournament. I caught every one of them pitching a nail weighted Cinco. That's just what I was doing. I mean, it's, it's deadly. You can't, it works everywhere. Pick your color, O-ring it, wacky hick it. You know, Gamagatsu makes, I mean, they make the best hooks as far as I'm concerned. When it comes to bass gear, you can't overlook a Gamagatsu hook. And go fish it, and you're gonna catch them. I mean, there's no doubt. The Cinco is probably, this is gonna sound really bad, but it's probably the dumbest bait that's ever been made. And it probably catches more fish than any bait that's ever been made. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Throw it in the water and one's gonna bite it. What, what's your opinion on guys who say, oh, you don't need to throw Senko, you can throw this other brand, or it, everyone that looks the same, they're the same, and yeah, I'm going, I, I'll, have you ever looked at them in the water? Like, yeah, what? I'll tell you this. <laughs> well, first of all, most of the other brands are stiffer, okay? They're stiffer. And and the thing with the thing that kills me with fishermen is, like, they'll say, dude, I do use a Senko when the bite's really, really tough, but when the bite's good, I just use, you know, I just use anything, and, and, it, and I catch them. And my reply every time is, when it's really tough, you gotta use a Cinco to catch fish. So when that bite's good and you're catching, how many more would you really be catching if you're using a Yamamoto Cinco on those good bite days too? So I only use the Cinco. Uh, great bait. I mean, they really, it's all, about, it's all about the wiggle, you know? It's all about the wiggle. And if you get a great follow-up bait is a, is a wacky rig Cinco. And, and it falls down, and if you'll watch it, both ends work like this all the way down. A lot of the other baits, they just, the Cinco, it has a lot of action to it. I'm a, I'm a diehard believer. I've just, I got lucky to catch too many big fish early on. I'm, I'm a complete believer in it. Uh, it was, it just, it was such a confidence builder. And fishing, so much of it revolves around confidence. It's unbelievable. Fishing a day, I might catch seven or eight, but I had good ones, you know? And when you go to the scale, it only matters what those five weigh, period. And so one day at a tournament, I said something. I was leading a forced wood open on Lake Shasta. And, um, and Cal was a rider for, I'm not sure which one he was riding for then, Cal Tatum. And he said, well, what are you going to do tomorrow? you got such a big lead. I said, I'm going to fish chicken tomorrow. He said, fish chicken, what's that? And I said, I can go top out here anyway. I've got a big lead. I'm going to stop out here and catch myself an eight or nine pound limit. That way, there's no gambling. You know, I'm with the eight or nine pounds, I can win. Then I'm going fishing for real, and I'm going to try to catch big ones again. But I'm going to fish chicken. He goes, so what do you mean? He said, you don't fish chicken, dude. You can't. If you're fishing to win, and you're going to win a tournament, you can't fish chicken. And that thing went everywhere. It, it actually got rewritten two more times. And it was just a different philosophy about trying to win tournaments by fishing for fewer bites and bigger I fish. I remember this. Yeah, you remember that? Hell yeah. Yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah. And, and honestly, that really honestly helped put me on the map to a degree because yeah. that, that article went coast to coast. It was yeah. just, it's just a different mentality. And I wasn't afraid to come in, you know, with less than a limit. I mean, I fished to win, but if I caught five big ones, I had a chance, you know. If you do it multiple days, you know, some of the guys are falling off. They catch a big one by luck, and then they're catching all them worm fish. It was hard for them to stay, you know. It was hard for them to beat my spinnerbait fish with their worm fish, what I'm trying to say. Um, and I just, it just kept going and going. And, you know, I started a rod company. I started a rod company. Rick, Richard lost his job, and he was building homes. They had like 300 employees, and they got down to 11. They lost, you know, they got to Rich. And he said something about, you know, we should just build a rod company. And had Richard, all the knowledge. Richard's your son. Richard, my son, mm -hmm. yes had all the knowledge to do it and everything, but all I wanted to do was fish and promote. So, you know, and truthfully, I mean, I worked nights and fish days. I worked for 19 years at a cable company. That's where I, I kind of destroyed my shoulders. Um, I worked 19 years, worked nights, and I fish days. And that's, it helped me a lot. I'd take my boat to work. Lucky enough, I didn't require a lot of sleep. So I'd work all night and I'd, we'd, I'd haul to the lake somewhere and I'd fish, you know, at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, run home, sleep a few hours and go back to work. And I did that for 19 years. And, and it really helped me. It, it made me operate on less sleep. So I, I mean, in tournaments, everybody's always dragging butt. I never was. I didn't sleep anyway, so it didn't really matter. Um, 
And then I quit my job in 1999. They got into a mandatory overtime thing that I would never be able to fish, and so I quit. Truthfully, I always did make more money fishing than I did working. I did, but that, can, that guaranteed paycheck was my security blanket. And with the family, I had to have a security blanket because there's no guarantees in fishing. You have good years, bad years, I don't care who you are, it just happens. So I quit in 99. Full-time fisherman in 99 did good. 2000, the worst year of fishing that I ever had, bar none. It got to where like I couldn't even spell fish. I put so much pressure on myself, I fished horrible. And it come right down to the very last event, whether I was even going to qualify for the year end quote anger the year or the year end qualifying. It took thirty five guys to the quote quote classic, and I'm sitting at thirty fourth. And there was a lot of us in that in that water right there. And I mean, here's something that I'm normally chasing the anger of the year title in. I'm the anger of the year, or I'm right there within a couple of spots every year. And here I am now. I'm a full time fisherman, going to kick butt, and I can't catch a cold. Because I put so much pressure on myself, I did terrible. And the very last tournament that snapped me out of it, I know this is a long story, but a guy said, Gary, how am I going to catch my shaft in November? I said, throw water away, spinnerbait, don't put it down. You'll have, a, you'll have a badass limit at the end of the day. So I was struggling. You know, I did. I threw it. They didn't bite it. And confidence level wasn't great. I'd been fishing bad all year. And so I'm over there worming on a point to catch a limit. And here he comes down the bank. On the left side of me, he catches, he catches like, you know, a shaft that was a good fish, like a two and a half pounder. And I see him catch it. And he goes, gosh, thanks for the tip, Gary, man. I'm kicking butt in this tournament. He passes me and catches another one on the other side of me. And I'm like, I looked at my partner. I said, we're done. We're done doing this. I've got an hour and a half. And I'm done, dude. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's kicking butt doing exactly what I told him. I'm too stupid to be doing it. You know, I'm stressing myself out. I picked that spinner made up. Call my, call my live roll three times in an hour and a half on that spinnerbait, on white or white spinnerbait, just like I told him. And I'm like, gosh dang, the next, very next week, we hit Orville on a, on a BASS, you know, on one of their open events. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if I finished fourth or something, I was like eight ounces out of, out of winning the event. And I was catching everything on the buzz bait. And it was just, an, you know, it was a great bite. I just, you know, didn't quite get the bite that I needed to win, but but I was catching them again, you know? And I mean, confidence is such a huge deal. I mean, I was a seasoned angler. Heck, at that time I had won a pile of boats. And I mean, I was, you know, I was considered one of the top anglers in the West. And I put so much pressure on myself. I was trying so hard, I did horrible. And uh, 2001, best year I ever had fishing. I was back in the saddle, I had the time. And, and it's the best fishing year I've ever had. And, it was absolutely awesome to catch him again and not be that guy that was, you know, at the end of the tournament saying, what happened? I sucked. That's what happened is I sucked. And, and, uh, and I started chasing the U.S. Opens and I did a lot of top tens there. I mean, the very first one I fished, I finished <laughs> second. And I just, I just wanted to win the U.S. Open so bad. And I mean, I, I got numerous seconds, got a third. I was in the top ten almost every time. And... Finally, finally, I got to win the U.S. Open, and I put a lot of time into it. I actually, I flew down and borrowed a buddy's boat, and I practiced for, I practiced for four days. I came home. I went back down about ten days later. I practiced for three more days. Came home again. I flew home, and then I towed my own boat down, and I practiced for three more days. And truthfully, I had patterns going. I'd never practiced ten days for a minute in my life ever, and. I had patterns on. I never even fished within 10 miles or 15 miles maybe of where I fished the day before. I mean, I never even went, I never even backtracked. I led day one by like two one hundredths. Day two, I had a big lead. And, and I gotta tell you something I really wanna say is like, I'm a firm believer in this, what I call fishing by your gut. And I think everybody has it and they just don't listen to it. And I listened to it that day. As I'm flying off a blast off early in, on day two of the U.S. Open that I got the wind, I'm flying down the lake, headed to my place that I caught on the first day, and the wind was crashing in on these rocks on, on the left as I'm running out. And I looked at that, and I'm like, there's always fish around Sandy Cove. There's always fish. I had practiced in there three days, hadn't caught nothing. But right now, I've got like three and a half foot waves slamming in there. And as I flew by it wide open, 
And I'm thinking, if there ever a day they're gonna be there, it's right now and I need to fish it. And I run for probably another half a mile and I have this thing, I always say I fish by my gut. I fish by my gut. My gut's telling me I need to go back. I spun that boat around, I went against the blast off, I went in there. My first cast with a deep little end, I was too far off the bank. Um, and it, like, I didn't get to where I needed to be. By now the wind's blowing hard at my back. My second cast hit good. I turned it like two times and caught like a two and a half pounder, which is a good one for Lake Mead. Um, got him in the boat quickly. I was fishing with an anger out of Colorado. And no, 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 that, not, not, not true. That was day three. Um, day two, I, I mean, on my third cast of the day, second cast I catch one, third cast I hope if I catch one that was over three pounds, it was truthfully one of the top five big fish for the day and be a thousand bucks. And by then, by the time I got that hard fighting sucker to the boat, I was on top of it. So I took the boat around, I cast, I cast, I cast. I picked a jig up, fired it out, and like probably after I'd cast another 20 times, thunk, you know, in about 18 foot of water, and I catch another one like, you know, two and a half or something. I'm like, holy mackerel, the blast off's still going on, and I got three studs in the boat. You know, just because I fished with my gut. And I'm thinking, there's another rock right around the corner that, you know, is probably on it. And to be honest with you, Pat Donahoe had his, had his remains put there when my, when my buddy Pat Donahoe died. He was cremated in that poor wee buddy. Um, I ran over there, I cast it by that rock. And as that line sinking, it hopped. I told my partner, get the net. And as I swing, and I got another two and a half pounder. I got four fish, stud fish, and I know I'm weighing in and the blast off still going on. And I, I, I wish I could tell you I had a great rest of the day, but I went down to Vegas Wash where I would get an occasional big bite and I beat my brains out down there and had a horrible day and finally picked a keeper fish up and I came in. But with the weight I had on day two, it put me in a lead by about six pounds. And that's a huge lead on Lake Mead, huge. And, and the third day, I'm nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. I've messed this U.S. Open up so many times, and I drew a guy out of Colorado named Bill Brown. And Bill said, man, we're going to whack him today. And I'm like, man, dude, I'm freaking so nervous. I mess this tournament up some way every year. I mean, I've just got to catch him. Because what are we going to do? I said, we're going to you know, go throw top water and stuff. And Bill said, well, i got a place we can just go drop shot a limit. That's all. Because if I catch a limit, I'm going to win, you know. And so we run and we fished, Bill's fish for just a little while, we didn't catch none. I said, let's go, man, we're going, we're throwing top water. I went into the narrows. I knew I wasn't gonna catch big ones, but I caught like eight or nine fish in there, not more. And I was throwing a suave, a little walking suave mm -hmm. bait, which I know you know what that yeah. is. And Bill was throwing a popper. But Bill was such a crush that day because he says, listen, I'm a good fisherman. He goes, you catch three, I'll catch two, you gotta live it for the day. He goes, I will catch two fish sometime during the day. It's just positive, you know, and I'm like, you know, we're gonna catch it, dude, and we and we caught him. And and I got the win the US Open. Finally. I mean it was just such a it was just such a milestone that I wanted to win and I just could never get it done. I was sickened to death of second place finishes. Um, and the rod company did well. My daughter came into the company and a, is a trained accountant, which was huge. Every company's got that. A strong accounting person behind him and she came in she fixed a lot of our problems and Richard being a fisherman me being a fisherman me doing really good with the raw design Richard being so social that he knew everybody in the world yeah. you know we had a we had a really really good mix and the rod company took off and my biggest fear always was starting a rod company and and having a job and buddy I have got a job, I have got a job now I mean and my fishing has sucked. You know, my fishing has sucked for a lot of years now because, you know, I sit behind a desk on a computer or on a phone. Even when I am fishing, that cell phone is ringing with dealers and stuff. And, and it's just part of having a business. Truthfully, I absolutely love what I do. I really do. I don't get to fish near as much. Um, I still fish. I still fish tournaments, just not well, because I never practice. I show up, I have a good time. And I see everybody, and that's you know really more important to me than, than anything else. And, but I love to fish. I'm going to fish till the day I die. And I spent a lot of time in Texas. You know, I fished a lot here. I fished for a lot. You know, and I love Texas, and I love the freedoms and stuff. And so when I come here to build a rod factory, um, a rod warehouse and stuff, I was going to build a 15,000 footer. But gosh, I could do it. I ended up building a 30,000 square foot facility. I got room to do whatever I want. We don't got to be conscious. We actually got so much inventory at one time, I had to throw a mezzanine in the back too. But 
It, uh, it's just Texas. I just got to tell you, I love Texas. It, when I built this facility, it wasn't in the city limits. I didn't have to have a single permit. I had to have one inspection. And that was when they threw power to the building. And the guy walked up and he said, you know that trench has got to be over 24 inches, right? And I go, yep. Yeah. He goes, well, that's 48 if I've ever seen it. <laughs> Starts laughing, turns and walks off. And I have power to the building and I'm in business. I mean, not one permit, not nothing. Because everything is engineered, everything is done right. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I'm so, it, I'm just spoiled with Texas. I love Texas. I love, I love the way of life here. I love how easygoing people are. Um, of course, Texas is all about fishing and hunting. Um, it's just, I, I couldn't say it anymore. I, I absolutely love Texas. I love having a business here. My business has grown a ton since it's been here. Um, being from California is not a good deal when one of them dealers from Alabama or Georgia or Texas calls up and say, where are y'all located? Uh, Northern California. <laughs> and, uh, they don't get, they get past the Northern, but then when you say California, it's just not a plus. I mean, they look at you like you got two heads going out of your shoulders. and. So it's not a plus, and moving to Texas, that's not why I moved to Texas, but moving to Texas was a huge, a huge boom, you know, with the business. It's, I mean, it's grew a lot, and I've got the room to expand. I got great people, you know, pretty much they work on their own. I get to do what I do with play with rods and make new stuff, and that's the stuff that I really like to do. My daughter still basically runs a company. She just does it. She really, truthfully does it from California. She does with a computer and telephone. She doesn't need anything. Richard still helps in California, but you know, I'm really hoping one day that I drag my kids out here. I mean, they'd love the way of life. My grandkids would love growing up in Texas. And, uh, um, but that's just a quick thing. I mean, I've just been, I was very, very blessed by being a guy that could catch fish and growing up with a fishing background. And the timing was right because I don't think I could do the same thing today that I did back then. I just don't think you could. You couldn't win that much. You couldn't, the fishermen are too good today. There's too much knowledge. You got too many young anglers that are super studs already. I mean, I just, you just couldn't do what I did back then. I mean, I've won 40 fully rigged bass boats. You know, 38 Rangers, one champion and one nitro. You just, you could never do that today. John Murray won 37. He was another Western angler. And Aaron Martin, I don't know what Aaron's total was, but Aaron was right there too. I mean, it's we fished for a lot of boats and a lot of money, and and it was a great time to come up. And I was very, very fortunate. Timing played into my favor. I was very fortunate, um, and I have a great life. And I'm blessed. And I mean, I know it every day, and I have a great life. I don't know what else to say. Awesome. <laughs>